Okay, Bill, the next two podcasts are going to be a lot of fun. I like fun. Paulo Guia, who describes himself as a former Christian, who takes a look at the claims of Christians. Yeah, it's just sad that this Paulo Guia is so taken in by Professor Ehrman on these things. I'm sad and taken in. I guess that's better than last time Dr. Craig talked about me. The intellectual life of this person was just allowed, well, it was, it was stagnant. It was, it, he was, had a brain-dead Christian faith. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And once again, we're going to need the help of renowned New Testament scholar, Dr. Bart Ehrman. I had to come back, yeah, yeah. Bart has an upcoming course that we're going to talk about later on. But first, we're going to address a critique to our video collaboration called Historian Has New Resurrection Evidence. Are you familiar with this young, up-and-coming Christian scholar named William Lane Craig? Up-and-coming? He's been around forever. <laughs> We've got a bit of a complicated setup for today's episode, so we're going to need a recap. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. It all started with resurrection scholar Gary Habermas. Dr. Craig, Gary Habermas appeared on Bertuzzi's podcast. It's going to be a really exciting episode because I don't even know what he's talking about. Well, some of the things that Gary said weren't really that new, right? Right. Gary has a Taco Bell case. Same few ingredients put together in a new way. It's the $5 Grande Crunchwrap meal, only at Taco Bell. Podcaster Paulogia had Bart Ehrman on to respond directly to Gary's five points. I don't know what these people are thinking. It's time to fact check the minimal facts guy. Especially since Gary Habermas quoted Ehrman so much. Gary wasn't quoting Bart. He was misquoting Bart. That was the entire point of responding. Gary was appealing to the authority of Dr. Ehrman over and over. So who better to refute Gary's claims about Bart than Bart? That's right. I'm happy to address them. And then swooping in at the last minute, like a knight on a white horse, <laughs> comes Christian philosopher William Lane Craig to defend the honor of Dr. Habermas. We were in the nick of time. You were in great peril. I did think I was. Yes, you were. You were in terrible peril. Who was himself unwilling or unable to respond. You've come to rescue me. Uh, well, no, you see, um... I knew someone would. And Dr. Craig, we're going to get you to do an overview of the whole thing. <laughs> so let's go to the first clip here. This is from Paul Logia's uh, uh, Secularist Podcast. And uh, he combines clips of Gary Habermas and then gets Bart Ehrman's response. Because this video is a response to a response to a response to a rambling presentation. It would be way too long to play all four levels of clip inception. So check the links in the description for all the context. We'll be focusing on Dr. Craig's newest comments. Yep. Great. Here's the first clip. Okay. The earliest Christian preaching, according to skeptics like Bart Ehrman and many others, the preaching of Christianity started immediately. I do think that that's true, but I probably mean it in a different way than Gary is using it. As soon as they thought Jesus was alive, they immediately assumed that God had raised him from the dead. They immediately then thought he really is the one chosen by God, and they had to figure out how it could be that the chosen one got crucified. And I think very soon they started thinking Jesus must have been a sacrifice of some kind. And once they thought that, I think, yeah, I think they started preaching that probably right away. What Gary is trying to enunciate here are three stages in the progression of the Christian proclamation of the resurrection. It's not so much three or five lines of evidence as uh, several stages. I would add as well, and the discovery of the empty tomb. One mustn't leave out the fact of the empty tomb uh, um, as part of the reason for their belief that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Should Gary add empty tomb to his minimal facts? Oh, I thought he did, but I didn't know he didn't. I'm not a big follower, so I don't know, but most people do. It's not a historically certain fact. It isn't one that I would say everybody agrees on. I'd say probably most people agree on the empty tomb. But I don't think it's as highly certain as, for example, that Jesus was crucified. I think that is really well attested, that he's crucified under Pontius Pilate, and that some of his followers came to believe in him afterwards. I think those can be givens that most people would agree with. But the empty tomb, there are reasons for doubting it, and so I, I wouldn't put it quite on the same level. One thing I would disagree with about Ehrman is when he says they wondered how the Chosen One could be killed, they thought he must have been a sacrifice. This sounds like a sort of ex post facto 
um, account of why Jesus, though the Messiah, was crucified and killed. And this notion of Jesus' death as a self-giving sacrifice for the sins of the people is a motif already present in Jesus' own lifetime. He prefigured his death in the Last Supper that he ate with his disciples on the night of his arrest, where he presented his impending death as a sacrifice modeled upon the righteous servant of Isaiah 53 who gives his life as a sacrifice for sin. So this wasn't some sort of rationalization invented later by the disciples. This was Jesus' own interpretation of his impending death, and it was his resurrection from the dead that convinced the disciples that, in fact, he was God's chosen one, despite the humiliation of his crucifixion. I think it's the only defense, and of course, it's not like he's like coming up with this kind of new philosophical perspective. <laughs> this is what people have thought for 2,000 years. <laughs> and so, yes, Jesus does predict in the Gospels that he is going to die for the sins of the world. That's absolutely right. The question is, is that historically reliable information or not? That's the question. And if you believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, as I believe William Lane Craig does believe, if you believe that, then there's no debate. There's nothing to debate. And so you don't need, actually, you don't need, need theology anymore. You just read the Bible. <laughs> and you don't need history anymore either. You don't need to engage in the Bible historically because you just read what it says, and that's what happened. And so people who have that view, that will be the perspective. Scholars since the late 18th century have recognized that the Gospels are not purely historically reliable, that there's material in the Gospels that the Gospel writers recorded Jesus as having said that actually represent things he did not say historically. They represent ideas and views that were put on his lips by later storytellers and by gospel writers. There's good reason for thinking that, lots of reasons. And in my course, of course, <laughs> of course, in my course, I'll be talking about what those reasons are. Why is it that scholars think that some of this material isn't reliable? One is because you'll have two gospels recording the same sayings of Jesus or the same deeds of Jesus that contradict each other. And as fully knowledgeable of Aristotelian logic, William Lane Craig will realize that if there are two contradictions, they both can't be true. One can be true and the other false, they both can be false. And so scholars have thought, based on contradictions and lots of other things, that there are a number of things in the Gospels that do not actually go back to the historical Jesus. Fair enough. And the question is, which ones? And it is widely thought among scholars that historical scholars, not evangelical theologians, but among historical scholars, that these predictions of Jesus that he's going to die for the sins of the world represent what later Christians assumed he must have thought. The later Christians knew that he was the Son of God, he was divine, came down from heaven, knew everything, and so he wasn't taken by surprise <laughs> on Good Friday. He knew this was going to happen, and he knew why it was going to happen, and so they explained that in the Gospels by putting it on his lips. And so it's literally in there, yes, but there are very good reasons for thinking Jesus himself didn't say these things. Okay, and here's the next clip. Now some fragments have been discovered. They're not New Testament. They're not inspired, but it's a little book that may only be 25 years after the Gospel of John. It's really early, and it's called The Gospel of the Hebrews. And it only exists in a few fragments. Guess what one of the fragments is? Jesus appearing to his brother, James. This is really cool. I don't think Gary wants to put too much weight on the Gospel of the Hebrews. If he's really talking about what I think he's talking about, the Gospel of the Hebrews has a very Gnostic orientation to it. And so if you credit it for some of its information that is satisfying to you, doesn't it mean you have to credit it with the other things it says about Jesus? You just can't pick and choose these things. Here I come down somewhere between Habermas and Ehrman, but I was really surprised to hear Gary appeal to the gospel of the Hebrews as vindication of this appearance uh, claim. I don't think anybody thinks that this is a historically accurate account of the appearance to James. I, I mean, quite the contrary. By then, people were well aware of the name uh, in Paul's list of eyewitnesses in 1 Corinthians 15. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And so this apocryphal story is probably a fanciful legend of the appearance to James um, built upon this single reference that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, maybe Gary knows something about this that I don't, but I'm not aware of anybody who would think that this is a historically credible account of the appearance to James. Eat it, Gary. That being said, however, Ehrman is quite mistaken if he thinks that you cannot discover kernels of historical fact in 
documents that may in otherwise in other respects be unreliable. Even if, for example, this uh, Gospel of Hebrews is uh, imbued with the philosophy of Gnosticism, that doesn't prove in any way that it doesn't preserve some historical memory of Jesus or of James. So you, you can't say it's a kind of all or nothing mm-hmm. thing, that either you got to believe it all or you believe none of it. If you took that attitude toward the documents of the New Testament, then Ehrman wouldn't even believe in the historicity of Jesus, which he strongly defends. He recognizes that even though he thinks the Gospels are in many respects unreliable, that nevertheless there are historical kernels there to be had which tell us about the historical Jesus. And so you can't just blow off the Gospel of the Hebrews because it shows Gnostic influence. Uh, You've got to uh, look at it more seriously and see if there could be a historical nugget contained in it. I'm not sure what he's objecting to with respect to an all or nothing view, because I don't know anybody takes an all or nothing view. I certainly don't. And he doesn't either. When he reads an essay in his field, or he reads a philosophical essay, there'll be things that he agrees with and things that he disagrees with. Things that he thinks are right, things that he thinks are wrong. And you do that on philosophical grounds when you're reading a philosophical essay, and you do it on historical grounds when you're reading historical sources. Historical sources are almost never 100% accurate and almost never 100% inaccurate. And so the question is, which is which? And in this course that I'm doing on the Gospels, I'll be talking about why it is the Gospels do have historically correct information, and they appear to have, and how you go about judging that, which is the way you judge any source. You don't come up with something special for the Gospels. You don't just kind of make up something. You do what historians do. (laughs) Historians study their sources in certain ways, and they have certain criteria for deciding what's probably likely to have happened in the sources and what's not. Which, if Dr. Craig had listened carefully was Bart's criticism of Gary's analysis, not some advocation of all-or-nothing historical method. By all appearances, the only criteria Gary is using in evaluating the Gospel of Hebrews is agreeing with the parts he likes and ignoring the parts he doesn't like. That's not how history is done. The Gospel of Hebrews we just have in fragments. We have a few quotations of it in some church fathers. And in principle, there's no reason to reject it offhand. You look at what it says, you look what it records about Jesus, and you treat it like any other historical source. You evaluate it in light of other sources or in light of other information that you have, and you determine whether this particular bit of it is historically accurate or not. So I think you treat every historical source the same way. It's probably a good time to give some details for that seminar you mentioned. So it's on the Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're calling it the Unknown Gospels, because even though they're probably the most widely read books of the Bible, most people don't really know what experts have said about them over all these years. And so the the course will be trying to explain in simple layperson terms what scholars have found out about these books. We're talking eight 30-minute lectures, four hours of prepared content covering topics like how historians understand the Gospels differently than most lay readers. Are they historical accounts or theology or both? Are they based on eyewitnesses? How do we explain the vast similarities and differences? and many more questions that most never really think about. And it doesn't matter if you're a believer or a non-believer or something in between. Virtually our only source of information about Jesus would be the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is worshipped by over two billion people in the world. So if you don't know about what the Gospels are all about and whether they accurately portray Jesus, whether they record what he really said, if they record what he really did, if you don't understand what they are, where they come from, or what they say, then I'd say it's pretty important. If you sign up by August 5th, you also get to be a part of the live Q&A where Bart answers class questions. But if you sign up by July 27th, you get an early bird discount. So pause the video and go to tinyurl.com slash bartunknown or find the link in the description so that you don't miss out. Even if you can't attend all the live sessions or if you're watching when those dates are in the past, you still get lifetime access to the recorded course, discounts on future courses, and so much more. And if you sign up at tinyurl.com slash bartunknown, you're helping this channel and its mission. So thank you. And this next clip, they get into the creeds. Let's go to that now. Because the early creeds say so. And we know they're early. Critics date these things to the 30s. Critics do. Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman says over and over and over that they're in the 30s. No. <laughs> why do people say that? You know, I think the, I'll tell you why I think people say that. They say that because scholars have called those pre-Pauline creeds. Now here is the key disagreement between Habermas and Ehrman. What he denies is the crystallization uh, into creeds that exhibit a a strong 
Christology in which Jesus is presented as fully divine, as divine as the Father. And this raises a very profound question. Uh, Christopher Kaiser puts it this way. He says, how could deity Christology arise among pious Jews whose tradition consistently opposed the exaltation of any living human being to equality with God? A Jew would have regarded it as blasphemous and absurd that any human being could be exalted to equality with God. William Lake Craig is a very smart guy. He's highly intelligent. But this just shows a profound lack of knowledge of ancient Jewish sources. Because we know of Jewish sources that talk about individuals who are called God, who are elevated to a divine status, who are made supernatural beings, divine beings. If anybody wants to read up on this, there's good literature on it. <laughs> I talk about it in my book, How Jesus Became God, but they don't have to take my word for it. There's a book by Alan Siegel who's a non-Christian, he was a non-Christian, very fine scholar who died young, unfortunately, who taught at Columbia University, Ivy League school, expert of ancient Judaism, who wrote a book called Two Powers in Heaven that talks about God having a second divine being with him, a second Yahweh, and that this was a theme in ancient Jewish texts. And so to say that no Jew would ever think of such a thing just shows that he doesn't know the Jewish text. By the way, Bill, I've got to give Paul Logia credit for creativity. This cartoon Bart Ehrman looks just like him. <laughs> it's yeah. a unique way of presenting this material. Yeah, it's just yeah. sad that this paologia is so taken in by Professor Ehrman on these things when the um, wide consensus of scholarship is quite in the other direction. It depends what you mean by consensus. Probably the majority of scholars of the New Testament are conservative Christians evangelical Christians. And the views that Dr. Craig has would be pretty much in line with what most many of them would think. Scholars who are not religiously committed to the text of the Bible as the inspired, infallible Word of God, but who are interested in approaching the text historically, this has been the move of scholarship since the 18th century. And it is the a move of scholarship, not just among crazy agnostics and atheists, but it's the view of scholarship among most Christian scholars, virtually all Christian scholars who are not personally evangelical. My training, for example, was at Princeton Theological Seminary, which was training Presbyterian ministers. All of my friends, virtually all my friends, became Presbyterian ministers and served the church as Presbyterian ministers. And the material I present is material, most of which I learned in seminary. And this is the kind of material you will hear. You will learn these kinds of historical critical views if you go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Chicago or Duke or Emory or Vanderbilt. So every major university that's not an evangelical, so not Houston Baptist where he teaches, but Kansas University, UCLA, any of the Ivy League schools, any of the major state schools in the country, Florida State, you know, any teach this material. So it's a little bit hard to say that it's fringe. My textbook on the New Testament, which takes these views, is the most widely used book in the college market and has been for over 20 years. It may be fringe among the people that William Lane Craig hangs out with, a Houston Baptist or in his church, but it's certainly not fringe in the world of scholarship. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you confess through the mouth that Jesus is Lord, and it's like Paul saying, and by the way, by Lord, I mean Jehovah. No, 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 no. Paul did not think that Jesus was Yahweh. This idea is being, I don't know, it's being passed around in evangelical circles, and I think, oh my God, this is so wrong. Paul did not think Jesus was Yahweh. Look, you can't use this Joel thing. Paul didn't read it in Hebrew. <laughs> He's reading Greek. <laughs> it's kurios. <laughs> Jesus is kurios, and kurios said so, so no, you can't do that. Here, Bart really misrepresents the point that Habermas, as well as uh, Hurtado, Baucom, and many others are making. No one is claiming that Paul thought Jesus was numerically identical with Yahweh. There are two persons who have equal claim to being God. Uh, and so in the New Testament, in order to avoid the confusion between the Father and Christ, the Son, Usually, the Father is referred to as Theos, the Greek word for God. Theos usually denotes the Father. But the New Testament Christians picked up the word kurios, Lord, which is the name of God in the Old Testament, and they applied that to Jesus. So that the, their doctrine was there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, 
and they would use Old Testament proof texts about Yahweh and apply them to Jesus. So this is one of the strongest indications of the worship of Jesus as God in the early church. But I think it's clear that Bart is, is just confused if he thinks that those who defend a high Christology are saying that God the Father and God the Son are the same person. That's incorrect. They are the same God, but they are two persons. No, I'd say that's an unusual interpretation. I don't think it's true. Theos is the word for God. Kurios is the word for Lord. Both words can mean a range of things. Theos can be used not just to one God, can be used to gods or divine beings generally. As Jesus himself quotes, the Old Testament says that the followers of the God of Israel are Theoi, are gods. Ye are gods. John chapter 10. So it doesn't just refer to God, the creator. Kurios is a word that means Lord, but it doesn't mean Lord God, creator of the world, Lord God. It doesn't mean necessarily a divine being. A Lord is anybody who is your superior. And so you would call a woman, would call her husband Lord. A slave would call his master Lord. Somebody who's employed by someone would call their other boss Lord. And you could call God Lord because he's, he's Lord. He's the real Lord. He's Lord. So when people call Jesus Lord, it isn't necessarily saying second member of the Trinity. <laughs> And so that's kind of silly to say that, actually. A few more clips to look at. Let's go to the next one. And these creeds are starting to pour out. And before Paul even takes his walk to Damascus of plus two or plus three, Paul knows all these creeds and he is ticked because it's heresy. But he meets the risen Jesus. That's step four. The blasphemy Paul tells you what's uh, upset him is that they were calling a crucified man the Messiah. For Paul, that was ridiculous. You're saying that God chose a crucified criminal? And so that's why it got Paul upset. Paul never says anything about the earliest Christians calling Jesus God, that that's what he was upset about. And so just read the passage. Well, now here again, Habermas is quite right that the uh, early Christian confessions of the deity of Christ precede Paul's own conversion on the Damascus Road uh, in AD 36. But I think that Ehrman is, is quite mistaken to think that the reason that Paul, the Pharisee, the uh, Jewish persecutor of the early Christian church, was all upset just because they identified this crucified criminal as the Messiah. That isn't going, that's not a heresy. That may be a, a stupid mistake, um, but to identify uh, Jesus as a Messiah uh, isn't something that is going to inspire religious persecution. Rather, it was, as Habermas says, because they put Jesus in the place of God the Father himself. They regarded Jesus as equal in divinity to God the Father, and that is truly blasphemous in Jewish years, and therefore would promote a campaign of persecution. But Bart's explanation that they were upset because they called a crucified criminal the Messiah, that would never um, prompt a systematic program of, of persecution such as was exhibited against the early church. I have a strong view about this. I don't think that Paul would have had to have heard Jesus is God to begin persecuting the Christians. I think that the claim that Jesus is the Messiah would be sufficient, but I think you have to understand what that would mean to somebody like Paul. To us, it just sounds like common sense. Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, his name's Christ after all. It's Jesus Christ, right? So what's the problem? But so why would Paul persecute somebody for that? Or maybe, well, those Jews just got it wrong. But see, that's really not the point. The point is that a Jew like Paul, who was raised in Jewish circles, who was of a Pharisaic mode, was a firm believer in the Hebrew Bible, stuck strictly to the Jewish tradition, was an apocalyptic Jew, someone like that in the first century would expect that the Messiah was going to be the chosen one of God, who God would empower to destroy his enemies and set up his kingdom on earth. That's what the Messiah was. And this was, of course, it's a political category in a sense, because it's something that's going to happen on earth. It's going to be a, something that happens on space and time. But it's also a religious category because this is the chosen one of God whom God favors. The reason calling Jesus the Messiah is a problem is because Jesus was crucified criminal. This is the opposite of what the Messiah was supposed to be. This wasn't somebody favored by God. This is somebody who was under God's curse. He got tortured to death publicly. And to say, this guy is the Messiah. And so for the kind of gut-wrenching value of that, it'd be like saying, I don't know, it's like what? Saying that David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, who's killed by the FBI, that he's the son of God who created the universe or something. I don't know. I mean, it's like, really? <laughs> Are you nuts? Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. So I think that actually calling Jesus Messiah was a very big deal for a first century Jew. Not like it would be for today, because it just seems like he's Messiah, that other one's Messiah, is just a mistake, right? No, no, no. It, not a crucified man. All right. 
The next clip. And the fifth one, Bart Ehrman says this may be the biggest argument in the early church for proving who Jesus is. Paul goes to Jerusalem. Do you remember Galatians chapter 1, which critics accept? Galatians is a book you can preach. Paul could not have gone there. Even the critics say this. Paul could not have gone there for 15 days and not discuss the gospel with the other two eyewitnesses. I mean, people infer that. Oh, they must have talked about what happened on Easter morning. I don't know what they talked about. What Paul says they talked about is whether it was legitimate to spread the gospel to the Gentiles without making them become Jews. He says nothing about them talking about what happened on the day of the resurrection. So you can infer that, but it's nothing I would ever say. It's not what Paul himself talks about. And I think that it is fanciful to think that they did not talk about whether or not Peter and James had seen Jesus risen from the dead, just as Paul claimed to have seen him on the road to Damascus. Fanciful. So he thinks it's fanciful not to accept something that is stated nowhere. So he's taking a position that is nowhere stated in any source from antiquity. And he says to disagree with him is fanciful. I don't think it's fanciful. I think it might be a different opinion. I don't know whether they compared resurrection appearances. I wouldn't be surprised if they compared resurrection appearances. I don't know if they did. He met with Cephas and James, and he himself says that Cephas and James saw Jesus. And so I wouldn't think that it's outlandish to imagine they talked about it. I do think, though, that their meeting wasn't to sit around to talk about the historical Jesus or his resurrection. Paul tells us why he was meeting with these people. He wanted them to sanction his mission to the Gentiles. And his mission to the Gentiles had to do with whether these Gentiles had to become Jewish or not, whether they had to start, whether the men had to be circumcised, or whether they had to keep kosher, whether they had to keep Sabbath, whether they had to do these things in order to be followers of Jesus. And Paul says that's what they talked about. Now, I think it would be fanciful to say they didn't talk about that because that, our one source says that is what they talked about. In fact, our both our acts also says that. So that would be fanciful. But it's not fanciful to say that they didn't talk about something that none of our sources says they talked about. <laughs> yeah, you would think. Let's go to the next clip. The creeds begin, and they are bombastic. Jesus was, existed before he was born. He received uh, eat, my, every knee will bow, every time will, tongue will confess. He was worshipped. He sat on the right hand of God. He shared the nature of God. Philippians 2, 6, Hebrews 1, 3. Formalized creeds. There's no evidence of formalized creeds before 36. What would be the evidence? The creeds we have are in Greek. There's something to suggest that Romans 1, 3, and 4 was maybe an original Aramaic composition, but it doesn't have a high Christology. <laughs> it's the whole point. It has an adoptionist Christology. The earliest creedal material in Acts all has adoption as Christologies, which means that Christ wasn't God. He was made into a divine being. Let's look specifically at this uh, text in Philippians 2 uh, that Gary appeals to. I think this text completely rules out Ehrman's claim that the early Christians had an adoptionist Christology. That is to say that they thought that Jesus was just a human figure who God then exalted to quasi-divine status. Here Paul describes how from this state of humiliation uh, and death, God has exalted him to this position of authority at his right hand through his resurrection from the dead. So this is the farthest thing from adoptionist Christology. Uh, the exaltation of Jesus is not from humanity to deity, which is impossible and blasphemous. Jesus was already in the form of God, equal to God prior to his incarnation. Rather, it was exaltation from this state of humiliation, even unto death, um, that God had glorified him then in heaven uh, and, and made him Lord of all. That's an interesting idea. So it's referring to the poem in Philippians 2, where Christ starts out that he's in the form of God, but he doesn't regard equality with God, something to grasp after. And so he instead, he empties himself and becomes a human, and he takes on the form of a servant, and he suffers even on the death of the cross. So that's the first three verses of it. And then verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So the word in Greek actually is God hyper-exalted him. <laughs> hyper-exalted him. It isn't just he exalted him, it's hooper. <laughs> he hyper, he really exalted which means he, I think it means that he exalted him higher than he even was before. Before that, he was in the form of God, but he didn't have equality with God. He didn't grasp after that. But then after he got crucified, God hyper exalted him and gave him his own name. And I've never differentiated between him doing that to a person who was humble or a person who was a man. It just means that after Jesus had fulfilled his task of humility by suffering on the cross, God rewarded him 
by exalting him to an even higher level to put him on a level with himself. And so it, it's an exaltation above his former status. But I don't think William Lane Craig and I are going to disagree too much on this because I think that Paul is saying that Jesus was a divine being before he became a human. And where Craig will disagree probably is he thinks that he was already maybe at the level of God, but I don't think so. And there are debates about the Greek involved, this whole thing. But it's clear that he's a human at one point and God exalts him and it is exaltation. But it's an interesting passage because it's both the idea that a God becomes uh, mortal and that the mortal becomes divine. Because some of the early Christians thought that Jesus was immortal who became divine, it's exaltation. And others thought he was a divine being, became mortal, that's an incarnation. And Paul's got a boat <laughs> in this one thing. It's a really fascinating passage. So I think you can get around it. It's an exaltation. That's what it says. He exalted him. Bill, let's go to the last clip. I have no qualms of people believing in the resurrection because it's a religious belief. But don't, don't tell me it's history. <laughs> you do not establish miracles on historical grounds. And so if you pretend you do, you don't understand what history is. And the reason you won't get a job in a history department in a university is not because they're biased against believers. There are plenty of believers who teach in history departments in the universities, but they don't claim that miracles can be established historically. Now, Ehrman insists that you can't establish miracles historically. And here, I would in, uh, refer our listeners to my debate with Bart Ehrman uh, on the resurrection of Jesus that took place many years ago at Holy Cross. And there it was very evident that what Ehrman is talking about is a warmed over rehash of David Hume's arguments against the identification of a miracle. What Ehrman says is, is a miracle by definition is the most improbable thing that could happen. And to establish it historically, you would have to show that the most improbable thing is the most probable thing, which is contradictory. Well, as I explained in our debate as best I could to, to Bart, uh, this argument is completely fallacious because he doesn't understand that there are two different probabilities that we're talking about here. The first is called the prior probability of the event. Prior to considering any evidence for the event, what is the probability of one's hypothesis? And that could be quite low. The second probability then is the posterior probability of that hypothesis given the specific evidence. And that probability might be extremely high. Given the evidence, that hypothesis might indeed be the most probable thing that happened, even though prior to looking at the evidence, that hypothesis seemed pretty improbable. So Ehrman's argument here is absolutely hopeless. It's just very clear he doesn't understand uh, the probability calculus or the uh, historical argument for Jesus' resurrection. Yeah, probably. Historians don't deal with posterior probability because historians will acknowledge that something really strange has happened, really strange happened. Oh my God, who would have expected that? And historians realize that if you're just using statistical probability, everything is completely improbable. 20 years ago, what would be the probability that I'd be sitting right in this particular place that I am speaking to you, sitting right it'd be, it wouldn't be in one out of trillions. It'd be like, so everything is improbable, but there's nothing that makes that so improbable that it couldn't have happened. And there are some things that are more improbable than others. So it's really more probable that what we're doing right now has happened than that this happened while I am actually stationed on Venus. And what you're seeing is my house behind me that I constructed on the planet Venus. That would be improbable to a point where you'd say, yeah, I don't really think so. And miracles are that kind of improbability. It's not that they would be technically impossible, because I don't know what that would even mean, but it would be that that level of high improbability. And so to say that it's more probable because it happened, well, from a posterior, from a posterior point of view, look, it happened, so it's more probable it would have happened. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So fine. He can play with the philosophical theories all he wants, but he's clearly not being a historian. I'd like him to cite some historians of World War I who do that, <laughs> or do any kind of history other than the one he's interested in. And Bill, don't be surprised surprised if a cartoon version of yourself shows up somewhere on YouTube shortly. <laughs> Probably. We don't actually illustrate apologists. Though, if Dr. Craig wanted to come on to refute Ken Ham on evolutionary theology, I could probably make an exception. But more importantly, if you haven't signed up for Dr. Ehrman's Unknown Gospels course, go to tinyurl.com slash today 
for the best deal on insider lessons from a renowned scholar. Okay, well, thank you. Great questions. I enjoyed it. If you want to see more team-ups with myself and Dr. Ehrman, tap on the playlist on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Okay, thanks, Paul. Later. See ya.